You might have heard the expression, to err is human. And this is kind of the foundation underneath human factors. It's a perspective that people are naturally going to make mistakes and it's not fair or reasonable to expect perfect performance at all times. You can kind of equate this to if you drive a car, that sometimes you might feel tired, you might be distracted, uh, you might encounter slippery road conditions that you didn't expect and you might slide uh, on the road or you might uh, hit very heavy storms, for example. All of these things are going to test your ability to maintain control of your vehicle and make it more likely that you're going to make a mistake. The same is true for pilots. Uh, pilots are absolutely human beings, and so we want to be expecting them to act like humans. You can't expect them to be robots and to perform perfectly all the time. However, the initial reaction to most accidents is to blame and then fire the people involved. Even though if you replace those people with somebody else, a lot of the time it's reasonable to think that somebody else might have made that exact same mistake given the same conditions. Aviation professionals are, with very few exceptions, extremely dedicated to their work and do their very best to do a good job every time. Despite this, again, we all have the same basic limitation that we are all human beings. All human beings have natural limitations on their ability to think and their physical bodies. So if you think about comparing humans to a robot, for example, humans would probably have the upper hand on things like critical thinking and problem solving, as well as creativity. Um, we also can be very physically talented. So we can have you know, uh, people who are expert craftsmen who can produce amazing works of art, or in this case, maybe able to fly an aircraft masterfully in really challenging situations. However, all of these things are limited. The downside we have comparing humans to robots is humans need sleep, we need food. If we are intensely focusing on something for a long period of time, we get fatigued and are more likely to make mistakes. So we have all of these natural and predictable limitations. It does not make sense to deny those limitations because it's just gonna to lead to mistakes and accidents. So instead, what we do in aviation is we have developed an entire science to trying to understand these limitations and creating resilience within aviation systems so that we can optimize people's performance and capture errors before they have any impact on a flight. So the human factors approach is basically taking the assumption that all of these human limitations can be studied and understood by using different aspects of science, including physiology, meaning how our bodies work, psychology, how our mind works, and ergonomics, how we can design systems to work well with a human. But there is a second error philosophy in aviation, which complements human factors, and they, they work hand in hand together. And this is the organizational approach. And within this approach to understanding error, we understand that human errors are a symptom of larger problems that need to be understood from an organizational perspective and managed. So you think of it from this perspective that human factors would be somebody's going to get tired, somebody's going to get confused or overwhelmed and make a mistake. But the organizational approach might be that senior level management was cutting corners and provided very poor training to pilots. And then we're finding a lot of these pilots are making the same mistakes because they haven't been trained to do their job properly. This is an organizational approach to this error that yes, the person is making the mistakes, but the reason why is bigger. It comes from the organization as a whole. And I'll often ask people, can you think of a job that you've had where you were really motivated to do a good job and you had a lot of support from senior management and you had all the tools and equipment you needed? And can you maybe think of another job that you've had where you did not have support from management, you felt very devalued and unmotivated, and maybe the equipment and tools you were given to do the job were malfunctioning and falling apart? You can start to understand that some companies and the culture in that company can directly impact safety. So that's what the organizational approach is. It looks at safety from the perspective of the whole company, where human factors really looks at sort of a scientific understanding of individual limitations. 
When you look at this graph, what you'll find is a representation of the moving average of accidents over a number of years. So if you look at this graph, what you'll see is that in the early stages, the accident rate was significantly higher. And if you dive more deeply into why, it's primarily associated with mechanical factors. So during the 1950s and 1960s, there were a series of really dramatic improvements that were made to the structural systems of aircraft. And you can sort of think of it that after an accident happens, we could identify if a particular system or component failed. And then the entire international aviation sector has a mechanism that allows us to implement what we call an airworthiness directive, which requires all of the aircraft of that type to be modified to eliminate that structural weakness. So in one fell swoop, we can really eliminate a lot of these mechanical risks throughout the entire global fleet of specific types of aircraft. So that was tremendously successful. So we saw this dramatic reduction in mechanically caused accidents. But where we are today is that we find that we are in a, a new system where the majority of accidents in aviation are primarily caused by pilot error. So they're associated with these human factors. And you can imagine that if an accident happens and the primary cause was a person not paying attention or not being aware of their situation, that it is nearly impossible to do the equivalent thing that you would do if it was a mechanical error. You can't go and fix all the people or magically uh, require them to think differently or to pay attention or to not get tired or overwhelmed. So it's far more difficult to identify these human factors issues and eliminate that risk because it is in many ways a fundamental aspect of being a human being. So CRM training really does focus on human factors issues. It could be things like workload management, so how to manage multiple tasks at the same time, situation awareness, which is sort of if you close your eyes, it's your mental picture of your situational environment, uh, as well as things like communication and coordination with both air traffic control and other pilots. CRM training is now mandatory every single year for airline pilots. And a lot of airlines actually do a good job of inviting mechanics and flight attendants and other professional groups to these sessions because you have to create an entire culture of teamwork to support these objectives. So you might ask, is this worthwhile and does it work? Uh, the general consensus is yes, but there sometimes is disagreement about this. Probably the most used framework for CRM skills is called the NOTEX or the Non-Technical Skills Framework. Non-technical means like it's kind of a soft skill. It's a skill that's not directly related to flying an aircraft, uh, but it is still really important. So in this framework, technical skills would be like maneuvering the aircraft and all of the knowledge you need to pass a written exam for your pilot license. And non-technical skills are all of these like teamwork and interpersonal skills. So sometimes they're called non-technical skills, sometimes they're called soft skills, and sometimes they're called human factor skills, but it all means the same thing. Read through the four categories and the subpoints below each and think about how this might relate to your experiences in working with people and trying to get jobs done together. So when CRM was first introduced in the early 1980s, there were a lot of people who rejected these concepts and called it things like charm school. And they thought, like, how ridiculous is it that you are trying to teach me to get along with people when I've been flying an aircraft maybe for decades and I have never had this problem? So there was some rejection of it, but we've actually seen CRM training evolve over time to become more and more effective. So in LOFT training, LOFT stands for Line Oriented Flight Training. And again, the line in an airline is sort of the operational environment. When you're flying the line, you're actively bidding and completing flights. So Line Oriented Flight Training means flight training that is specifically looking at the real job. And so in LOFT training scenarios, pilots are placed in a flight simulator and they work through a scenario. In that scenario, they encounter maybe emergency procedures, and their goal is to uh, apply these CRM concepts to real-world problems. So it's trying to take it away from just a classroom-based theory course and one that's more applied to the real world. 
And then you can evolve it even further using a LOSA audit and threat and error management training. A line operation safety audit, or a LOSA, is where an observer will watch pilots during the course of their normal flight experiences, and they will write down all of the threats they encounter, so kind of risky things that they see, and every error that they make. They then create that into a big database, and for the entire company, they have a listing of the most important threats and the most common errors that their pilots are making. They then create what's called threat and error management training, which is an evolution of CRM training, which is based on the data that comes from this audit. So we really take this training and we really focus in specifically on what the threats and errors are most likely within that specific company. So as you can see, there are different types of CRM training in the industry all from basic CRM, which often is a classroom environment teaching you sort of about your limitations, to line-oriented flight training, which is in a flight simulator, very scenario-based, all the way to threat and error management training, which is probably still completed in a simulator and very scenario-based, but the scenarios that you get will be precisely repre representing the most critical threats to your specific company and the type of flying that you do. So there's a variety of implementations of this in the real world. So beyond CRM training, human factors is actually an entire field of science. So there are a variety of academic researchers who focus exclusively on the science of human factors. And basically what they're doing is they're trying to design tasks that are as efficient as possible, safe operating environments, equipment. Uh, they're going to help companies choose the people who are most likely to be successful in the job. Probably the best example of that is the military. Because the military invests all of the money they pay for pilot training, they might invest you know, $2 million in training costs into each individual. So they have a very intense selection process before you even join the forces to become a pilot. So they'll do uh, thinking tests, uh, learning tests, hands and feet tests, medical tests, all sorts of really interesting things, as well as training. So we'll also design training programs to help people avoid some of these challenges. So again, we sort of talked about the categories of human factors training. Often, as I said, it's sort of things around cooperation, leadership, situation awareness, and decision making, among other factors. Some general important considerations in human factors is that human limitations apply to everyone. They are natural and predictable. Uh, they do not reflect incompetence or a lack of effort. So for example, if everybody who took this course had uh, was taking the course and had not slept for the last three nights in a row so if you've been awake that long i can guarantee you that nobody would be learning anything from this lecture and you would have a very difficult time getting through you would find it very very boring very fatiguing and likely would be falling asleep this is natural it applies to all human beings likewise human factors do not often directly cause an accident but they reduce a person's ability to manage any complications that arise. So it's not like you get distracted for five seconds and immediately the aircraft crashes. It's more so you get distracted, uh, maybe you're overwhelmed or you're paying attention to something else, and during that time you miss some critical pieces of information and then it has a ripple effect that does contribute to an accident. Uh, the third point is that systems that are used by people need to be designed to be error tolerant user-friendly, and interfaces need to be consistent between different types. So we need to work with people to try to make the job more efficient and easy so that they can understand how to use it. Probably a good example of that are all of these online lectures. You probably notice that we follow the same type of template in every lecture, and the goal of that is to make it easier for you as you move from one lecture to the next, that you know what to expect and how to navigate and how to move through it. So it's again one, one of those things you have to work with the way people think, uh, because when you're doing that, you're giving them more capacity to solve problems, to learn, and take in new information. There are a variety of different considerations when you're talking about human factors. It's not one thing, it's sort of a, a broad collection, very multidisciplinary, that looks at a whole bunch of different things. Ultimately, what they have in common is that they do involve a person and a system, and it's all about sort of that interaction between the human being and the system that they work with. So if you look at the slide, you'll see a variety of different um, considerations in the realm of human factors. 
culture looks at both an organization's culture, sort of like the their attitude towards safety in a company, but also how individual culture, so people who come from different parts of the world have different expectations of communication and how they work together. Communication is also really critical. So you can imagine a lot of systems require a team of people working together, whether that is two pilots on a flight deck as well as communicating with air traffic control, or even in sort of medical settings where you have um, perhaps a surgeon and an anesthesiologist and a nursing team all working together and having to use standardized terminology so they have you know, a really precise understanding of what everybody means. Mental health and stress are really critical factors. What you find in aviation is that all pilots need to maintain a medical certificate for their pilot licenses to be valid. Unfortunately, this incentivizes pilots taking an attitude of trying to be macho and tough it out rather than to be open about mental health challenges because they are at fear of losing their medical certificate and thereby losing their employment. Um, so a lot of stress is denied in these industries. People assume that they're better than stress. And of course, all the evidence and research suggests that that's not humanly possible. That's not how it works. Um, but it is unfortunately the way the system is designed. Fatigue is something that is completely non-negotiable. Uh, there is a lot of evidence suggesting how a lack of sleep impacts people in a variety of different ways. And it's interesting because there are several anonymous aviation reporting systems. Uh, one of them is called the ASARS or Aviation Safety Reporting System, which is managed by NASA. It is publicly available so anyone can search and find reports that have been submitted anonymously by pilots. And there are a lot of interesting examples around fatigue really crazy examples where both the captain and the first officer fell asleep in the middle of a flight and you know ended up flying significantly past their destination uh, only to wake up maybe by an air traffic control call and then turn around and go back so um, this is something that is very much present in organizations uh, so the the issue isn't whether or not it exists and is a problem the issue is whether or not people choose to deal with it situation awareness is the mental picture of your environment so if you close your eyes, everything that you can remember about the situation that you're involved in is a reflection of your situation awareness, as well as decision making, which is sort of making the right decision in time pressured situations and workload management, which is putting your energy into the right task. So the reality is a limit of human attention is we can't pay attention to an unlimited number of things. We have a capacity for our attention. And therefore, when we're doing a job, we need to focus our attention on this most important aspect of the work we're doing. So for aviators, uh, we're often taught um, the system where it's A and C. So aviate, navigate, and communicate. And the goal of this is to focus a pilot's attention on flying the plane first. And then once the flight is stabilized, you can worry about navigation issues. And once that is figured out, then you can manage uh, communicating that to other people. So the idea would be that if a pilot was in an unusual attitude, like the aircraft was in a spin, uh, the most important thing wouldn't be them declaring a mayday over the radio. The most important thing would be stabilizing that flight. So I hope that this uh, brief introduction to human factors has provided you some insight that might help with some of your work. The reality is that any system that involves human beings needs to be designed and built in a way that is considerate of natural human limitations. If you ignore this factor, you are integrating an element of risk into the system that doesn't need to be there. So thank you so much for taking the time to watch the video. Uh, my name is Dr. Suzanne Kearns. I am an Associate Professor of Aviation at the University of Waterloo, and I appreciate your time. Thank you.